So what I want to do today is finish up. Um, so we swap one of the lectures because there were sort of three on the same topic. Uh, finish up helium, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the current understanding of how we might make white dwarfs blow up as type 1a. Dan did some things. Where's Dan? Dan's preparing his lecture. Good for Dan. Okay. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Um, Dan's going to do more on white dwarf mergers, so I'm going to, at the very end of uh, sort of the last half of this talk, do a little bit more on um, sort of stable accretion and how stable accretion may give us type 1a supernovae. So when I left off yesterday, what I highlighted was the fact that you can, in helium burning and, and shells of helium that we've put on white dwarfs, get into this condition of what we call dynamical burning, where the evolution of the shell and evolution uh, of the convection is happening on a time scale that's more the dynamical time. And so just to remind you, this is a, another plot showing as a function of time for just a 40 second period on a white dwarf, uh, how fast the heating time is. In some sense, you can tell that from this axis. But basically, the time scales for evolution are getting short. Uh, the pressure is starting to drop. That's because it's undergoing some slight radial expansion. You see the, that's the pressure. The temperature is rising dramatically. And you're actually starting to make carbon uh, because of the helium you've been burning. But the main point is that th at this point, the velocities of the convection zone um, are approaching the sound speed. And so we have a fundamental problem, uh, which I would claim we haven't understood, but I want to sort of walk through for you some of the possible different outcomes as to whether uh, this shell can transition into what's called a deflagration. Just to remind everybody, a deflagration is a burning front that moves at a speed less than the sound speed. A detonation is a burning front that, that is basically a shock where the material is shocked and post-shock it's hot enough to complete the burning. And this is a debate that all of you, well, I've been witnessing it longer than many of you, uh, that for the type 1a supernovae, there's been an active debate for a long time. Do they detonate? Do they deflagrate? Um, and I'll never forget a meeting I went to in Seattle maybe 20 years ago where the debate got so strong that all the observers just walked out of the room. <laughs> and the reason was that there was no connection to observations uh, because it was so deep in the white dwarf that you know, the theorists were having a grand time, but the observers were, uh, which was, I think, the right answer for the observers to walk out. The problem was the theorists didn't even notice it happened. <laughs> Um, and that's when I decided this would be a good field to get into um, because I, I try to connect the data when I can. So what I'm going to walk through, this is, a, this is a MESA calculation. It's a one-dimensional calculation. It's the evolution in time uh, of a little brief period of the shell. Okay? So the shell flash is going. And this time uh, is the time, just, this is a clock running. I've just zeroed in on the... On, Oh, well, of course it's like this. <laughs> of course it's like this. We're doing the mixing link theory. This is, this is at the center of the white dwarf? No, this is in a shell. This is a helium shell. But you're following the shell or you are the fixed? This is, at a, this is at the base. These are all at the base of the shell. So, so last time, uh, I don't want to bring this up. So remember, now I'm going to wave my hands. So here's the floor. Beneath me is, the, is, is material that's not convecting, and this is the base of the convection zone. Okay, and so I have convection. I am going to go like this because I have to. Um, but the te every, all the, the, for this plot, everything I'm giving you is at the base of the convective zone. Now, the temperature is at the base is, a fixed, is, is evolving with time due to the fact that it's actively burning. And that's why you see the temperature at the base of the convective zone rising. Um, the composition is, of carbon is rising because you're actively burning helium into carbon. Um, the pressure is decreasing a bit because you're actually starting to get spatially, of, you know, the, the shell is getting geometrically thick, and so the pressure is starting to drop. You're getting out of the thin shell limit. The main thing here is that this is happening on a time scale where you can't even get a sound wave around the star. Right? That's the, that's the main issue. Okay, so, so uh, what do we want to do? Well, let's start by exploring... And in some sense, this is driven by asking what would, what would um, if we do make different assumptions, what outcomes do we have? And can we start to constrain those outcomes by comparing to observations? Or are there observational predictions we may make? So let me first show you 
uh, what a detonation wave looks like if you have helium. So what's being plotted here now, so now this is a, this is a homework problem, which I'm not going to ask you to do in 30 seconds or five minutes. Um, this is a calculation of uh, infinite medium, helium at a density of 5 by 10 to the 5 grams per cubic centimeter, which is not crazy for where we're at. And I just ask, what is the detonation speed in that material? The detonation speed is to five digits, this number, 15,230 kilometers per second. It's an eigenvalue solution if I have an infinite medium. And what it looks like is a function of position. If I go into the co-moving frame of the detonation, I can ask, as a function of position in the co-moving frame, what's happening to the helium as it burns? It's declining as I go past the shock. And I can ask, what are the elements that are coming and going? And here they are. But you might notice a problem, which is that this is a mathematical problem. It doesn't know about a white dwarf radius. But you may note that uh, this distance at the end here is 10 to the 11 centimeters. Okay, so to get complete burning at this density in a helium detonation wave, I need to, I need to have the material be allowed to go at a distance of 10 to the 11 centimeters. So the first problem you realize is that these detonations are not going to be able to completely burn. They might not even work. That's, they might not even be able to happen. Right? Here's a white dwarf radius of 10 to the 8, but we're only in a thin shell at the top. So maybe go to 10 to the 7. So maybe I'll burn 10 or 15% of the helium, which means I won't get as much energy release, which also means I won't be moving at this speed. Um, and so that's the major thing to first keep in mind. So the, these helium detonations are funny in that respect, which is that they're not going to do complete burning. So there'll always be helium left. Well, of course, what we do first is something you should never trust, which is uh, we do a detonation in 1D. We start it at the base of that vigorously convective shell, and we let it go up. And it sends a shock wave into the star. And of course, in 1D, the reason you shouldn't do this is because it's crazy to imagine that the whole star at one moment knows that it's time to detonate and it sends waves out in all of, three, you know, all of 4 pi. But we do it anyway because, you know, this is how you make progress. And so what's shown here is this is, now this is mass above my head. So this is a, a 0.06 solar mass shell. So there's a, this is the, uh, the detonation wave going out. So this is showing temperature at different time steps. So this is about 14 seconds later, 16, 18, 20. And then there's a weak shock wave because there's a pressure pulse, a weak shock wave that goes in. So in this case, the carbon oxygen down here does not start to burn. It doesn't get hot enough to burn. So you just send a shock wave in. And the shock wave that goes out does make fuel. Okay. What do you make? This is what the composition looks like after the wave has gone out, radially outwards. Uh, you've, you've done nearly complete burning in this case, uh, right at the um, base. But as you move out, you'll see that you basically do not get to complete burning the helium. You make other elements, iron 52, chromium 48, titanium 44, and then we just marked where carbon 12 is. OK, so what's interesting about this, and this is the, the major thing I want to highlight, is that if I were to have this, this is, um, we're going to go ahead and ask what a light curve would look like from this. Of course, you're familiar with nickel 56. That's the main thing that powers type 1A and powers late time for type 2P. You're less familiar, probably, with iron 52 and chromium 48. Uh, but these are other two elements that are alpha elements that are also unstable. And so these have half-lives that are reasonably short. And so these can also be power sources for radioactive supernovae. Uh, and of course, carbon isn't exciting at all for this. So Stan and Dan uh, have did the same thing, not not long there, um, sort of building on some of the work that Dan, uh, Stan had done years ago. Uh, in this case, they they left a little bit of helium behind, so this is out is going to the right. You see a bump of nickel, and again, you see that most of the helium isn't getting burned, and then they're not highlighted here, but these are the, some of the other radioactive elements. So generically, that's what you get. 
if you do this 1D, but remember this is 1D now where I'm sending the wave out. So let's just first ask for this what you would get. So this is the, the stuff we started doing about a decade ago that we called point 1A supernovae, which is let's just say, well, what, what would that give us in terms of a light curve? So I'm ejecting maybe 0.05 solar mass as a material. It's going to be coming off at 5 or 10,000 kilometers per second. So Udi did the algebra for you as to what's the duration of that light curve. And, and all of you remember, of course, his result. I, I, I put 7 in here. He wouldn't have had the 7. Um, but basically, this is the same result he showed, which is it depends on the opacity of the material, the ejected mass, the speed of light, and the velocity of the material. And the duration for these systems should be 3 to 5 days. And again, because it's so compact, it wouldn't be shock heated. You wouldn't be seeing anything of the shock heating because they've undergone so many radius expansions. Rather, you have to depend on radioactive heating from these elements. And, and here I'm showing the half-lives of the three main elements that would be the power source for something like this. So what I'm showing you here are different light curves. Uh, this is time since explosion. These are bolometric light curves for a 0.05 solar mass on a 1, a 0.02 on a 1.2. And as you make the shell masses bigger and bigger, you see the duration gets longer. Um, and there's more radioactive elements, and you're seeing them also get typically brighter. So the prediction for some kind of explosion, if just the helium shell goes, the prediction is something that's, um, well, a tenth of a supernova in brightness for a tenth of the time, which is why we called them 0.1As. Yes? This is the core mass of the, C, of the CO core is the 0.6, and the other one is the mass of the shell, the helium shell. Yeah. So it's, it was that on, it was, so it was a 0.3 on a 0.6 or a 0.02 on a 1.2. Okay? So this is sort of the generic prediction for an event where just the helium shell would leave, and it would leave behind, in this case, a remnant. We have, we're not blowing up the underlying white dwarf. Okay, so again, I think this, you, this was basically the same calculation as what Udi had shown you previously, and the difference is that the power source for these has to be this radioactive heating at this point. Okay, any questions on that? The, the rise times seem rather shorter. Than the rise times are really fast. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, the radioactive heating is, is the driver for a lot of these. So you don't have to wait. So that, the, think of this as really the duration. This is not really the rise time. This calculation is really the duration of the event, not the rise time calculation. So. Because, oh, because the thing is, because the decay times are so short? Well, it's, it's that the, the rise is not determined by, this is the time it takes for heat to diffuse through the whole ejecta. So that's and that's, usually, that's usually the rise. That's the time it takes for you to see everything. Um, no. <laughs> no. That's all I can say is no. Yeah. You have radioactive, I mean, there's, so for these, there, you have stuff that's radioactive decays on, you know, half a day or a day. So there's a, you know, these are different because they're radioactive, de radioactive decay times are really short for this material. So I, I haven't done it with, if I just got rid of all the nickel, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I forgot rid of all the short half-life stuff. If the, if the decay times were long, then it would be the rise time. There'd be no other physics that would determine it, but there's other physics going on with radioactive decays. That's right. Yeah, that's right. If there was, I mean, so, so type 2P rises in a day. Even then, with, that's not radioactive heating. You, you, get to the, you get to the typical plateau luminosity in a day even in that case, even though the formula would tell you 50 days. So, so the formula really is about duration. Right. Where's the seven from that you had? Oh, that's just nice algebra. Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, yeah. This is if you do it for this ejected velocity. Um, so again, relative to 1As, uh, again, just to put it on scale, uh, here's a typical type 1A, very slow, but again, factor of 10 brighter. Um, and these are what these would look like. Now, there's a few events that were plausible, but of course, as time goes by, you're excited, but they typically uh, get shot down. So I would say right now, we, we don't really have 
uh, something that I would say is a smoking gun example of one of these. We have things with light curves that look comparable. Uh, so one of these was PTF10BHP or 2010X. Um, this is definitely an unusual supernovae which peaked at the luminosity we talked about and had a decay time about five days, but the spectra do not match what we'd expect. So the elements aren't what we see. But this is just showing that indeed the light curves are comparable. So these are just two different models that we had sitting around when this happened. But again, uh, so a very rapid rise for this event. These are the data points. And these are just two different explosion models. Uh, but the spectroscopy is a real challenge. And, and to read about this, there's a really nice, one of the many, people have probably mentioned this, but this whole handbook on supernovae, uh, which costs, what, $1,000 or something? <laughs> Uh, but there are articles on the archive, so Taubenberger's 2017 article uh, has got a really nice summary of the status of comparison of the 0.18 model to these three different supernovae um, and highlights the challenge of spectroscopy. Okay. Yep, please. I thought for most of these past ones, the explosion time wasn't really constrained. So what is the day zero in that last plot? In, in, so in the last comparison plot that you were uh, T0, we took to be basically this, this first point. Yeah, it's, it's the same point, so you can, we can get them off here. So it's that, it's that point is, is, is what we put at T0. So this is that point that not quite at T0. But there's, there, are, there are upper limits shorter than that, right? So what you're saying is there's no upper limit right in this region. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I don't have the light curve here for um, 08, which one was it? The one that the Maria Drought had, 05 EK is, is another comparable light curve. So there's, there's really, there's right now, so 05 EK, I don't have the, all the data in front of me. 2010X and 05 EK are very similar events. Um, but I would say the spectra don't really match the 0.1A model. But I mean, we need to figure out what they are. So they're, I mean, it's interesting because at least you have two events instead of just one, right? Okay, any other? Okay. So, as I already said, the real concern here is multidimensionality. Um, I think it's not really plausible to think that everything's going to detonate at the same spot or at, at the same time everywhere. Uh, it's much more likely to start somewhere, in which case then the question is, if I have this layer of helium and some place does detonate, which I'm not going to say we can prove, what we can calculate is if it does detonate, will it be able to propagate on the star? So that we can calculate. Now, the reason that's tricky is that any fuel that can detonate, as, as I showed you before, you might need to have enough of it to get the detonation. You need to have this burning time behind the detonation front, behind the shock front. And so if I have a really thin amount of the fuel, it actually can't detonate. And so this is known from chemical detonations, which is that you need a certain amount of something to actually get it to detonate. And it's a, sort of a similar physics problem here, which is that layer, as I go across in this dimension, uh, might just not be thick enough to allow for a propagation. So let me show you a successful propagation. So this is work with Dean Townsley and, uh, um, oh, hang on. Uh, and Kevin Moore. So this is, uh, I'll show you this movie a few times. Uh, there's no soundtrack, but you... So that's a helium shell on a white dwarf. This is a temperature plot. Obviously two-dimensional calculation. That was a successful uh, detonation around the star. It did propagate. Yeah. So there's a few things to look at. So what I want to, in this run, what I also want to highlight is you'll see, you might be able to see it hopefully, uh, there's a slight perturbation that goes into the star. So this is a pretty thin shell, but there is a pressure jump and that pressure jump does send an acoustic pulse into the star. And the acoustic pulse is strong enough that you can see it a little bit on the temperature plot. So if you watch this contour carefully, you might have to watch on the TV, you should see that acoustic pulse uh, strike, strike that contour. OK. 
Can you see it on the TVs or not? It doesn't even show up here. Huh? You can see it there, okay. And you might also see at the very end that something's happening here. So the first thing to say is that the time for this to go around is faster than the time it takes a sound wave to get from here to here through the star. Okay? So that's, that'll end up being important. Right? So this wave does go around the star. It is moving slower than that number I gave you. And the reason is it's not doing complete burning. Um, but it does send a weak acoustic pulse in. And because of geometry, that weak acoustic pulse strengthens uh, at the antipodal point at the late times. Yes? Yeah, it's a 2D calculation, so it's sym symmetric in this dimension. I'm just showing. You said something is happening at uh, the bottom. Yes. Uh, there's no edge there or something, right? So you have uh, a noise of water in a. Meaning the destination should be there. Is it. Ah, okay. Yeah. It's mirrored. Yeah, it's, it, it, it has to be mirrored. Yeah, okay. definitely. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, we'll see that we'll show this movie a few times. So, um, so let me sort of go to a certain place in the movie. So first off, this thing did burn quite incompletely. It propagated at a speed of 9,000 kilometers per second. So it went slower. That's an indicator that this, uh, this might have quenched. This didn't quench. Um, and this is showing the temperature behind the front, the detonation front here. Um, and this is helium, so again, it's leaving about, it's only burning maybe 25% of the helium, okay? Here's what the profiles look like of different elements. Here's helium, carbon, calcium-40, chromium-48. This is radioactive. That, that'll be, that's good if you want to make a light curve. And nickel-56. There's very little nickel-56 being made. And then this is just showing for different cases for a 0.02 solar mass on a 1.2 or a 0.012. All of these propagate, um, but they have different elements. So let me just show you this. So the nickel is, so for this one, which is a, a thicker shell, this is where the nickel is dominant. This is where the iron is dominant, the red, that was convenient. Uh, chromium is the green. The blue is titanium. Uh, and calcium is the, the yellow. If you bring the shell mass down to even smaller amounts, it almost doesn't even propagate. Um, and what you make is mostly, uh, in this case, titanium and calcium. Um, you make almost no radioactive elements. So if this just ejected, you know, it's kind of fun but boring to imagine that you eject 0.05 solar masses of calcium out. Um, with no radioactivities in it, you wouldn't see anything until it ran into something. So you'd have the shell going out at 10,000 kilometers per second of calcium. And if there's no target, you don't see anything. Um, so that would be boring. But there is a, a mass below which these, shell, these shells no longer will sustain a propagating detonation. Okay? And, and that was, the I would say, the, the, the big um, new thing that this allowed for is for the type 1a problem, which I'm going to highlight, is that I can uh, have sm much smaller amounts of this material on the surface than sort of the conventional scenario. The conventional scenario for this um, were typically masses of 0.1 to 0.3 solar masses in helium. Those pretty much go to nickel, um, and they really make the light curves difficult for type 1a supernovae. The conventional double detonation scenario was a much, much thicker helium shell than these shells I'm talking about here. And in those, for those helium shells, when those detonate, you end up uh, putting a lot of nickel at the surface of the star. And that is very difficult to accommodate for a type 1a supernova <coughs> light curve. So if you wanted to make a type 1a, that was a difficult scenario. And that's mostly why it had fallen out of favor. Okay. A second white dwarf? 
Um, those were typically the SDB star donors in that case. That's right. So let me just show you this, this final punchline. And this is, again, from the work. This is Kevin Moore's PhD thesis. So what's shown here is, as a function of the core mass, what's the envelope? Uh, and a function of the envelope mass, what's the outcome? Um, and so this blue line is pretty much the minimum mass you could have that would sustain a detonation wave propagating across a star. And when it does that, it pretty much just makes calcium. There's a calculation that Dean Townsley did in Flash that didn't propagate, that was a dud, and that was this line, that was this guy. So it's very close to what you'd get from the, this analytical work that Kevin did. As you increase the mass of the shell, so you just go at a fixed core mass and increase the mass of the shell, you start to see that you make heavier elements, titanium-48, then chromium, iron-52, and nickel-56, as you go up in this direction. That's what the color code. And then this is where you, how high you have to be to finish burning half of the helium. So the major point is that for these core masses that are typically 0.8 to 1.2 that we care about, we can sustain propagations of detonations of quite low shell masses. And that, that was the major outcome of this effort. And what that allows one to do uh, is to actually think about using these again as a way to, to get the core to ignite. Okay, so let me pause here for a minute. So we, I haven't, sh we haven't shown that a detonation starts. All we've shown is that if you start it, it will burn. Okay, that's all we've shown. How far away, regarding the submission, how far away are the densities that, that, and temperatures that need to be put in to ignite? How far away are they from what we see in the progenitor or what we would expect? Oh, no. So there's progenitor scenarios that give us these shell masses on these cores. So that, that's why this is of interest. So they, both the AMCVN and the SDB stars naturally give you shell masses like this for these core masses. You can easily get the, to these ignition masses. Oh, okay. So the... Maybe the ignition temperature needs to be added. No, the only, the only thing is I, I, we don't have a way uh, to sort of prove to you that that vigorously convecting shell suddenly triggers a detonation. We haven't done that. Right? All we can say is that if, you start, if I go in by hand, which is what we did here, put a detonation in and you stand back and watch, you will see that it propagates. Okay. If the shell gets thinner and thinner and thinner, you put that in, and all it does is it just blows out outwards, and it doesn't propagate at all. And so these lines, you've got to be above these, basically you've got to be above this blue line in terms of the mass you have to actually sustain a wave going around the star. I'm sorry again, what would, yep. be, what would be needed to put it in by hand? What does that mean? Oh, that just means I go in and I double the temperature somewhere. Yeah, easy, easy computationally. Right, so, so there's an industry, you know, which I'm not summarizing for you because there's a lot of work that's been done. Uh, and it was, it was really built mostly on the carbon problem of how you get from a vigorously convecting place to a detonation. And typically it's talking about rare events of a place where you know, I've got a large volume available to me, this whole shell over all of 4 pi r squared, that somewhere in that volume I get a place that is of the right conditions where I can get a temperature perturbation large enough that it can start to really take off on its own. But, you know, that's, that's a different problem. Yeah, oh, three questions, good. So what's the physical criterion which determines uh, this line? Oh, yeah, this is, this, uh, there's, this is, there's two pieces of physics here. So one is the fact that I've got vacuum above me, and so there's heat loss due to the expansion. Right? So that thing, just you can see it in the movie. Right, The minute I shock it, so what you're doing with the detonation is you shock it, and then you need to let it burn at the new temperature. So the first thing that happens when you shock it is it expands radially. So that's, that's, the, that's actually the major piece of physics. There's a piece of physics that, with the curvature as well, which is a little bit less important. But that's it. So it's just the fact that I shock it, and it's going to expand radially. So it's not confined. If I put a top on it, you know, if I could confine it, it would be easier. Is that PDB work? It's just, it's just adiabatic expansion post-shock, right? It's just that if, if, if I do adiabatic expansion post-shock, the temperature declines, and that's not good for the burning. I need to keep it hot. So that's mostly the physics. Yeah. So last time I saw this kind of abundance that goes straight, and I yeah. was wondering if that uh, burning point is uniform temperature, then I think it's sort of like a 
You probably won't have this kind of stress. Yeah, let me go back to the, um, the there's a re yeah, let me go back to the temperature plot. Here's the temperature plot. Um, so at the front, uh, it's, well, you can decide if you want to say it's uniform. It's not, it's not really that uniform, right? Yeah. See? It's, yeah. What stops or starts? What stops the stagnation? What stops it? Yeah, that you trigger the stagnation. Yeah. Um, no, so, it, so, so I, let, me, let me say it more clearly. So the experiment is I put a shock wave in. So I try to propagate a shock. Um, if there's no nuclear burning, right, the sh if with a finite energy shock wave, it'll just dissipate as it grows in volume, right? So what a detonation wave is, is a shock wave where behind the shock, I put enough energy in via burning to keep the shock going. So for these cases where, the, where I don't get a propagating solution, it's because there's not enough burning behind the shock front to keep the shock powered. So it just fails to propagate. It's not that it propagated for a while and then failed. It just never propagated. Yeah. So, so I may have misspoken. So it never propagates. Right? So you just keep cranking it up. And, and, and you know, no matter how much energy you put in, it'll never propagate. And then you get to finite shell thickness, and suddenly it just goes. Right. Equation of state? So the real equation of state. So what do you want? It's all there. I mean, <laughs> it's you know radiation, it's electron degeneracy, it's gas pressure. Oh, this was most of this. This is flash. This is all Helmholtz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the, the equation of state here is. Thankfully, there's no issue with the equation of state for this. Yeah. Yep. So assuming that the uh, pressure wave does propagate through the core, so do you expect to see something happen like at the end? Yes. <coughs> Which is great because that's what I'm going to do next. So I'll show you. OK, anything else? OK, so for all of these, the shock that, that, that was right beneath here was so weak that the carbon didn't ignite. Okay? Um, again, for really thick shells, you can ignite the carbon directly in ETH, and they, they, they call that edge lit. I mean, there's all this jargon, which unfortunately you have to know because that's what's in the table, right, when you read the papers. So none of these will edge light. Okay, so can you ignite the CO? Um, and this is where it gets interesting. So there's a great paper. And it's fun that Ami's here. Ellie was here yesterday. So this is a paper from, uh, well, 1990. And this was the, the first good numerical simulation showing that you could get this off that you could get this focusing of the shock wave via an off-center, um, that would be off-center. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to show you their simulation, but they, it's, it's the same calculation. I'm going to show you the, the, the work from Matthias Fink just because the movie is a little bit easier to see. Um, so this is a much thicker helium shell. And what they're showing is a propagation of the helium shell. Now this is a little bit stronger so you can actually see the perturbation. Right? That's why I like this. So it moves further down. Now the helium is here. This is again just the shock wave that's being sent in. You can see it's pretty weak. This is a temperature plot. Um, pretty sure, yes, it's temp this is temperature. No, it's density, sorry, density plot. So there's a, you know, there's a slight compression, right? But again, this, this wave that's coming from the top is from the detonation when it was here. So this point I made about the wave moving around faster than the time to get through still holds, okay? So the wave eventually comes around, sends a shock in, that shock coming in meets the shock from the other side. So this is what they call the off-center detonation scenario. And so in this case, the claim that was originally from uh, Ellie and Ami was that this would be the location where you could trigger a carbon-oxygen detonation. Okay? 
and then that would then basically go. So then you just you burn the whole star at that point. Okay, so that's the off-center scenario. And again, the reason I would say it did fall out of favor was that the, the original calculations had these really big helium shells. And just for type 1A, it just wouldn't work. But with these much thinner helium shells, you, it's harder to rule it out. And that's what Dan sort of highlighted uh, when he was talking earlier. So I just had this movie again. So I, didn't, I don't know, if, I guess you've seen it enough times. But you will see it again at the bottom. So the racing, maybe it's easier to stand over here and see it. It's really hard to see, but it's right there. Can you see it? All right, and then it's meeting there. All right, so it's the same. So another worry is that, that uh, as the shell gets really thin, the speed gets slow. And if the speed gets so slow, the sound wave can get out the, I don't want to say South Pole, but I'll say it South Pole, <laughs> gets out the South Pole before the shock, before the detonation comes around, right? Huh? The answer, yeah. The, 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 yeah, exactly. So what's the problem with this scenario? So, so there's definitely been more work done on this. In this symmetry, this will work. Of course, the big worry is, is there some reason to believe you only have one spot that goes, right? Well, you don't have, a, thankfully, you don't have a lot of time. So the time clock, you may have noticed on this, is about a second. So if you want this scenario to happen, you have to argue that you don't have another place ignite in the one second that this happened, okay? The evolution time is about 10 seconds for the shell. So again, this is, I, I can't tell you what's really happening. Yep. Is there any geometric concern in the sense that this is shooting and it's going to converge, you know? Of course, okay. yeah. Yep, yep. The, 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 so it's something that, that many people worked on. I would say, you know, Ken Shen did a nice work on it. The carbon's pretty easy to ignite is the bottom line. So that, it's a little bit easier. So if you do oxygen neon, so we worried about whether this would actually get oxygen neon to ignite, and I think the answer there is no. So again, I think we could prove that counterpoint. But carbon oxygen is a little bit easier to get going than oxygen neon. So I mean, you could worry that this could just take an oxygen neon white dwarf and blow it up, right? But we don't think that's possible. But yes, I mean, these are all, and you could do 3D today. I mean, nobody's, I don't know if anybody's even tried a 3D yet. I don't know if Ami's done 3D, no. So the criterion for uh, igniting the CO is that you propagate quickly enough, right? Well, the first criterion, yeah, exactly, is that, is that, that, is that you get the, 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 the... mass of the shell? Yeah. So thankfully, thankfully, that criterion always worked. So if you get a propagating wave, it ends up always being fast enough that it gets to the south pole before the shock wave goes through. Could, it, that just, that, that worked out. According to the calculations that were done, what's the kind of uh, limiting uh, heat, uh, mass of the helium shell? Or what's, what's the borderline? Uh, the borderline is this is pretty much this this value. This this you got to be above the above the above the blue or the yellow line, roughly. So it's still less than ten to the minus one. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for minimum shell. So if you want to do a CO and you think that you can't build a CO bigger than one, you have to go here. And then you've got to find a shell mass above this value on a 1. That's easy. The accretion scenario is do that. There's no worry there. The dynamical, you also want it to become dynamical, right? And so on here is shown the dynamical. The dynamical condition, if you're stringent, is way up here. You want a higher shell mass. That was what I talked about last time. Now, again, we don't even know this condition, except we know if you're above dynamical, you've really got problems. So all these things are leading you to the same, and thankfully the accretion scenario has put you here. That's what's interesting, right? Is we have accretion scenarios that naturally put you there. And sure, we have some that put you way up here, um, and those, those, you know, those should explode. Those are easy. Those are easier to argue should really blow up. We don't see events like that right now. Right? That would be, you know, two tenths of a solar mass of nickel at the surface. Um, well, so, so Dan showed, uh, okay, so uh, it's too bad Dan's not here. Um, so here's what's interesting about this uh, from someone like myself who's a bit of an outsider in this field. I haven't been doing this for too long, only a decade. <laughs> um, you were all taught probably that type 1A are near Chandra Sakar, or Chandra Sakar mass white dwarfs, 
right? Maybe you weren't taught anything. Okay. If you were taught anything, that's what you were told. Okay. And so it's a little bit of sacrilege to go back to this in the current. And thankfully now, five years later, it's not. But what's interesting, what people have shown, is if you do just detonate a one solar mass, CO white dwarf, you can put a little shell on it if you want, but the bulk of the mass is 1 or 0.8. That gives you a pretty good type 1a light curve. And that's Dan sort of hinted, showed that, hinted, and there's papers on that. So that's there as an available solution to the type 1a problem today, right? Now, you can ask, why didn't we do that 20, 30 years ago? I, I wasn't there. I can't tell you. Right? I'm just asking if there's like observations and were these observed? Uh, well, no. What I'm saying is if, if, if the theorist can take a, I'll, I'll tell you the answer, right? A theorist can take a 0.95 solar mass carbon oxygen core, put a detonation in it, make a light curve, and make a type 1 supernovae for you, and it will fit the data. Not just the shape, but also like the... Oh, yeah. Spectra. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's been done. There's two or three papers that have done that. So, um, pardon me. No, I just showed. It's this is the scenario. The scenario I showed you is how they would do it. Yeah, it's this. It's this scenario. Yeah, that's, Ami. Mean. Yeah. Correct. We, we don't see them. Right. So we want to take those that are much harder to detonate, yep. use them as uh, progenitors, and, uh, and ignore the others that are much easier. So for that, I don't have an answer. Me either. Yeah. 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 Okay, any more questions? And the other thing that Dan showed was that if you det as you re decrease the mass of the CO core, you reduce the amount of nickel you make in the detonation and that the, what you see for the diversity of 1As in terms of sort of the crude Phillips relation is just the, the variable there is then just the mass of the CO core. That's the hypothesis in that scenario. Okay. Yeah. So I guess depending on the envelope mass and core mass you choose to use, you'll get different kinds of light curves. And yes, yes you will. Right? So That's correct. So, so but, for a thin, but for thin shells, the only way you'd find out this is the early, early data. So if you're an observer and you want to test this hypothesis, you want to get the earliest spectra you can get. Because that's the test. That is the test of this. So I'm just wondering, how would you, like, <coughs> what would you guess is the reason for the homogeneity of type 1A light curves if this is, if this is a major channel? So type 1A light curves are not homogeneous. They're heterogeneous. Right? There is no single type when they like. There's, they're a very heterogeneous set. Uh, right. I guess the Phillips relation is something that... There's a, there's a relationship. That's right. And you can, you can get that relationship with this variable being that you go from 1 down to 0 0.8 for the CO core. That's what Dan showed. So there is not a single um, type 1A supernomy. Right? It's a very heterogeneous. Heterogeneous, but you're, you're right. It sits on a relationship. That's correct. I meant homogeneous in that sense. Like yeah. There is a relationship. Somewhere. There is a relationship. That's correct. So the cause of that relationship is an important question, right? In this scenario, the explanation of that relationship would be the CO core mass. That would be the variable. That's, 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 that's how you would do that. And that's, yeah, that was what Dan hinted at briefly. Yep. So there are also supertrenous car mass in type 1 super So is that consider, con consistent with this helium? Shell detonation model? No. Nope. Nope. I can't get ejection masses above just roughly the, the core. So I cannot, for this scenario, I, no can do. Nope. I'm just going to, I'm going to crush all of your 1A uh, uh, biases. Yeah. And uh, this spectroscopic signatures of these different 
external compositions that would be correlated? Yeah. Well, a lot of fast, you know, a lot of a lot of stuff coming off really fast, right? This stuff, this stuff, fast calcium you see, which is suggest, which to me has always been interesting. Yep. Yep. Um, but then, also fast to back again. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you, you know, that, that's all trace amounts, you know, compared to all the stuff that's coming from. The that's correct. That's right. But it's but they'd be velocity segregated, right? The velocity segregation would hold. So. Yeah, it, it's the it's it, yeah, and it, it's the velocity is what you have to depend on. Okay, so now more to to dash your. Uh, I put this in. So you should ask this question. Many of you were told, on your parents' knees that the reason type 1A supernovae were all the same is because they were all the Chandra Sakar mass, right? That's what you were taught, taught. And I've just told you that there's another hypothesis which says that that's not the case. So why? Why do people talk about the Chandra Sakar mass anyway? Does anybody know? Does anybody actually know? A student? Sorry. I'm going to... Anybody less than 40? <laughs> <laughs> What's special about getting massive for a white dwarf. What happens to the center as you go as you approach the Chandra's car mass? You're supported by degeneracy pressure, but what's happening what's happening to the electrons? Electron capture. There's electron capture can happen, right? You're starting to become really relativistic. Right? As you become relativistic um, it's it's starting to to collapse. It's starting to be ill-defined what the radius is. It most likely collapses, and so the density is really spiking. Okay, so that's the reason people talk about this, because the old scenario, which may still be completely true, um, is you ignite carbon at the core. So let me just remind you of that, because that's really important. It's something you should know absolutely. Uh, which is, if I just go in the density temperature plane, I can draw a line where the carbon burning uh, equals the neutrino cooling. So above, and this is just showing the variety based on, based on the physics of, of how you can get carbon to ignite. So you can do it by getting hot, which is going this way. So on this side, the carbon burning beats neutrino cooling. On this side, it's the inverse. So you can do it by getting really hot, or you can do it by getting very dense. Okay, and so I'm just showing over here, as a, for just a generic uh, sort of homework problem, white dwarf, as I go from 1.25 to 1.37, the density goes from 3 by 10 to the 8 to 3 by 10 to the 9. Okay, and so for the parcels deep in a white dwarf, the equation is very simply just carbon fusion and neutrino cooling. And if I get above this line, the carbon's going to take off. That is why. Uh, people talk about doing ignition and, and explosions with near Chandrasekhar mass white dwarfs is because they were igniting them by getting them cold. What I just talked about was igniting them at lower densities by getting them hot. Okay, so that's just an important piece of physics. So the question is, um, you're sort of taught in stellar structure that above about one solar mass, you don't have carbon oxygen white dwarfs, you have, you have oxygen neon white dwarfs. So the first thing you have to do is somehow get a white dwarf up. And I talked about the challenge of that yesterday, which is that um, for most of the accretion scenarios we know, it's hard to get the white dwarf to increase in mass because of the shell flash instabilities. So this is the, the paper by Nomoto, Tielemann, and Yokoi that Dan mentioned last time. So the classic paper on the single, what's called the single degenerate scenario, <clears throat> where what they're showing is this, this line is the condition at the center of the star. Okay. The dashed lines are the temperature profile at a given time. So they start with a low mass white dwarf, which is nearly isothermal. And then they attach to it a very hot shell of 
burning material, and then they accrete at a rate of 4 by 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year. And if you wait 2.5 million years, there's been heat transfer into the core, which has heated up the core, and this is the profile. Okay? As time goes by, you're adding mass, so the density is rising, and heat's coming in, and so you're getting hotter and hotter, hotter and hotter. But eventually, you really have to, to you're not going to get it hot enough to ignite on that branch. You have to get it hot, you have to get it dense enough. And so you have to get it over to this point, which is that ignition curve, which is the sort of, we call it the cold ignition. And this is ignition due to what's, what's called the pycnonuclear reactions, the fact that the zero point motion of the ions is what sets the center of mass energy for the fusion instead of KT. And so that's what you have to do. So this is the, this is the standard textbook type 1A scenario. And that's why you have, that's why all the expectation was that these were all at or near the Shannon Scar mass. So mass was not viewed as a variable because they were doing these kinds of ignitions. Okay, so that's just the important piece of physics. The problem with this scenario is the one I mentioned the other day, which is that if we're adding hydrogen, there's so many unstable flashes, it's unlikely to grow in mass. And so the problem with this scenario has been give me an example of a binary where I can actually stably add material. Okay, so what I want to do in the last bit of this talk is talk about one scenario where you can add helium at a rate that's stable, which can potentially get this realization. But I want to pause here before I go into that to see if there's any physics questions on this ignition. So what you see on this plot <coughs> is just the trajectory of the center when it goes, but what it really does for a while as well is simmer, um, and that's what Dan talked about. So this is, a, this, is a, this is a good, this is just a paper I wrote with Tony Pyro, which at least shows the plots, which is why I wanted to have it. So again, here's different ignition curves depending on the microphysics. Once I ignite the core, I get a vigorous convective zone, so it's not unlike the shells I showed you before. And as a function of time, um, this just rises up. This is the trajectory. And again, up here, we're showing where the heating time is becoming about 10 times the dynamical time. So the physics I talked about just plays out again. Right? And this is the scenario that leads to a deflagration or a detonation for the whole white dwarf, for which there's you know, 500 papers. Okay? So I'm not even going to try to summarize it. But that's the, what Dan talked about. So the question is, is there a binary scenario that can get an ignition like this? That's the thing I wanted to highlight. Okay. Uh, well, the, the one I know of and the one that um, we're actively working on and, and is a pretty good scenario is one that involves helium star donors. So I love this paper because of the title. So it's very suggestive that you know, it's the first binary, you know, this is 20 years into the field, right? So this claims that there's nobody else has done it because it's the first. Um, and this is, this is part of their paper. Uh, Self-consistent is the right answer, was that, that the other papers basically assumed they bypassed all the shell flashes and said, well, let's, let's not worry about it. But they found a scenario, um, and this built on work of even in Tudikov, a scenario that actually can uh, create helium at a rate to hit that magic stable helium rate. So here we go. So, uh, and, and again, this scenario really came from even in Tudikov. So for those of you who are really interested uh, in these systems, you, you, what you have to do is print out and hold close all the even in Tudikov papers because most ideas you may have are probably in that paper. Um, so you, it's depressing because you think you've got a good idea and it's there in section 5.2.9. And figure 26, uh, okay? Um, so what this is, is a, uh, this sounds rather cooked up, but it's actually pretty generic. So this is a, you know, roughly a 0.12 day orbit. It's a, it's a bare helium star, that's 1.6 solar masses. So it's the core, in this case, it's the core of about a 10 solar mass star. So the scenario is you form a mass, you form a white dwarf. Remember I showed you, um, two days ago that 
the most massive stars, 8 to 10, make the most massive COs of around 1. So if I have a 7 and a 10, or let's, let's say 12, whatever, 7 and a 10, uh, one of them will make a white dwarf first, the 10, if they don't do mass transfer. And then the 7, uh, when, it when it basically tries to cross the Hertzsprung gap, will discover it's in a binary and lose the envelope, undergo a common envelope spiral into a tight orbit, but the helium core still is there and it's burning. Okay? So that's this kind of scenario. And what you do is, this is showing the evolution of the helium star. So it really is, in this case, they just built a main sequence 1.6 solar mass helium star by hand. Doesn't really matter. Um, and it's, in the HR diagram, this is the core helium burning phase. And then eventually it burns out and it has a CO core and a helium envelope and it, and it undergoes expansion, like many stars do when they start to differentiate. And at this point, it fills the Roche lobe. So if it was in a wider binary, it would just fill the Roche lobe at a different place. So there's a large, large amount of these binary orbital periods where you get the same scenario. So what it is, is it's undergoing helium shell burning. The envelope's trying to expand. And that envelope expansion is overflowing the Roche lobe. Okay? These would only be, though, in... So what's important to keep in mind is this scenario works well in those galaxies where you have stars of this mass. Okay? So in an elliptical galaxy, this will not be a scenario. But in a spiral, this would be a good scenario. That's important to keep in mind. There's a whole rich phenomenology of type 1As and which types occur where. This is a good scenario in a star-forming galaxy. So what's interesting about this is, is, so this is again from their paper. So now they're showing you the mass of the white dwarf. So they start with a one solar mass CO, the most massive CO you can have. That's not crazy. Because for a stellar population like this, the, the, you wouldn't have low mass white dwarfs. You have no, had no time to make them. So this, this is not a crazy scenario. It seems cooked up, but it's, it's actually not. And uh, as it expands, what happens is it tries to... So this is the stable burning regime. So I derived that last time, right? This is the stable helium burning regime. You see we're up in mass accretion rate now. We're around 2 or 3 by 10 to the minus 6. So we're up a factor of 10 or 8 from what I showed you for hydrogen. And what happens is uh, it's providing more. What it wants to provide is this dashed line. And it's providing more than it uh, needs to. And so what they showed in this paper was that uh, this factor of sort of 2 excess just leaves the system. And then it burns what it needs to burn until it gets uh, below there and you have unstables. But the point is the mass gets up and this is ignition. Okay. So what's interesting is that they really did add 1.36 or 0.36 solar masses, sort of, I would call honestly. It's a real calculation. Okay? So, um, so we got interested in this, and, and Evan, uh, Jared Brooks, for his thesis, did a lot of different scenarios. And so, indeed, this is a pretty generic result. So this is showing different, different mass donors. Um, all for obviously a one solar mass, and this is, uh, these are the recent calculations. Again, this is showing the stable burning regime, so there's mass loss, would be the expectation. There's mass out there somewhere. Um, and then these all underwent uh, center ignitions, core ignitions, and I'll show that evolution. But we also discovered that sometimes you actually get off-center ignition of the carbon. And this is a different outcome, so I'm going to sort of close on that as I go through this. So some of these go below the stable line and would start doing flashes. That's, that's what this is. This is not a, ty a typographical error. Um, this is showing many, 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 many flashes. Okay, because it went unstable. It's beneath the stable burning regime. So this is helium flashes. Okay. So this is also a helium novae scenario if you want. These would be helium novae right here. Oh yeah, sure. So, so here we, I think here he did a retention efficiency of like half probably. So he was retaining some of it. Yeah, 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 you, yeah. And you see this guy had some too. The flashes are, thankfully, they're pretty weak. So some of these don't even overflow the Roche lobe. So the, yeah, they're pretty weak flashes actually. Okay, so what's going on inside the white dwarf? So here's the 1.6 solar mass donor 
onto a one solar mass. So this is temperature versus density. Um, and let me start with this yellow, well, let's see yellow, whatever this color is. I'm violating my own rule. Um, so what you see is the core has gotten heated up. This is the core condition. This is the original one solar mass coordinate. So all of this stuff outside of here is what's been added to the star. The helium burning layer is this region beneath this point. And so all of this is hot carbon oxygen ash, right? So you're burning helium to carbon oxygen. So you're adding carbon oxygen onto carbon oxygen. But it is hot and it's getting compressed. And here's the ignition curve for carbon. And so what you see is as a function of time, here's the core going up to this point. And you see the shell is also getting pretty close to ignition. So there is a race that's going on here. <coughs> for this case, uh, it got, and this has then gone off the plot, the ignition did occur at the core, and you start to see the convective uh, shell. And so in this case, when it was 1.37, this did a core ignition. So you can honestly get core ignitions this way. If you do a slightly higher mass donor, the race is one at the shell, and you actually ignite the shell uh, rather than the core. And if you ignite the shell, you've got a totally different problem now. Um, so I'm going to pause on this before I talk about what happens if you ignite in the shell. But let me see if there's questions on this scenario. You're, you're going to ignite a detonation in the core, right? No, the, all, we, we don't no, no, typically not. Typically, it just it does a simmering phase and then transitions to a deflagration. This is a standard belief at this point. Okay. Yeah, that you don't go to a detonation in the core. You do a deflagration is the typical story. So, yeah. Okay, so, no, but I'm getting at that if, if you don't then turn it into a detonation, then you won't get something that looks like a 1A in terms of... Right, right. So Dan hinted at this other scenario for these now, which are the 1AX, which are just a few plumes going out and leaving behind a remnant. Uh, for one of those, the progenitor does look like a helium star, so this, this might have some life in it, as a, but not for type 1A supernovae. Yeah. This ignition line you're plotting is just uh, this line? right between nuclear losses and, and carbon, uh, fusion. carbon fusion. That's correct. Right, so the convection is just getting heat around. This is really getting heat out of the star because it's right. neutrino cooling. That's right. right. So yeah. above that, there should be another line, which is convection you can't uh, sustain. It. Yeah, that, that would be, that's correct. So that line is, is not on this plot, unfortunately. <laughs> um, that line is on this plot. So this, this, is, this is the line of roughly T heats 10 dynamical. That's when you're starting to get into that regime. That's right where even the convection has, has to be supersonic. So typically what they do, I'll just tell you what, <clears throat> I'll tell you what people do, because you need to know. Okay, it gets a little bit hotter. They say, ah, uh, it's gone dynamical, so they ignite a deflagration wave. So they send out a combustion front that goes through the star. It's Rayleigh-Taylor unstable when it gets to a certain size. So you start developing turbulence in that. And then as it gets out to a larger radius, they transition to a detonation wave. That's the standard sort of W7 model that Dan highlighted. That, that's sort of the classic case. If instead at this you say, well, no, there's going to be a few plumes that go, um, then some of those plumes can actually just independently evolve, and they just go out and pop through the surface and escape. And that's, that's been a pretty active research problem now that, that has a fair amount of promise, actually, for, the, for this one type of supernova called type 1A AXs. So. But that's, yeah. Yeah, this model was worked on a lot because this was the only type 1A model for 20 years. So, okay. Yeah, so that line would sort of sit right around here, yeah, on this plot. That's right. Oh, yeah. So, Um, so, in, yeah, so you mean in this case, this mass that goes to infinity? Sorry? Yeah, so it's a, we, we have the same as what you and Langer have. Yep, same, same physics. So what happens is um, you're trying to supply more fuel to the 
white dwarf than the stable burning can accommodate. So what we would expect to happen is that the, if the white dwarf were by itself, it would just grow into a red giant. But because it's in a tight binary, it can't. And so the expectation is it just starts losing the mass at its own Roche surface. So the, the big variable here of uncertainty then is how much angular momentum that stuff takes when it goes to infinity. So you can get different outcomes of this scenario based on what you take for the amount of angular momentum being lost with that wind that goes out. But it's basically any time you, you try to provide more than you can get from the stable burning, then the stable burning can accommodate the expectation as it goes away. So, oh, this would be roughly the orbital velocity. So it would depend totally on the orbital speed, or the orbital uh, separation to get the velocity. So just to close, I, well, I've got a few more, uh, 15 minutes, something like that. I'm between you and dinner, so I'm going to stop appropriately. Um, yeah, so we're probably only five more minutes. So we've known for years what happens if you do a shell ignition uh, of carbon, because it happens naturally in stellar evolution. So if you take just a nine solar mass star, in stellar evolution, it does an off-center ignition. Um, and this is just a, one example. And what that ignition does is it actually sends a flame front into the star and burns carbon to oxygen neon. So this is what it looks like if you just do that. So this, this shaded region is the convective region. Uh, this is time. Now, you've got to love these units. Um, this is about 10,000 years, OK? <laughs> All right? So. It's about 10,000 years of evolution. So what it is, is uh, it's actually a flame that's moving into the star, right, burning the carbon and oxygen to oxygen and neon. Right? That's what this is. And so you convert everything inside of that region gets converted to oxygen and neon. So if I ignite off center and I convert to oxygen and neon, I can no longer get a carbon ignition in the core. Right? That's the major issue. And so. It's probably not going to be a good thermonuclear supernovae scenario. Um, and what you would get instead, if I now blow up my diagram to allow there to be more physics, um, so here's the old carbon ignition line we talked about. If I now say, no, I don't have any carbon any longer, what's going to happen next? As was already mentioned, two things will, two, well, multiple things will happen. One is there's always, there is some magnesium and neon from the carbon burning. It will undergo electron captures at a fixed density. That's what these lines are. And there's oxygen around. And if I make it even hotter, I can do oxygen ignition. Okay. So if I success, successfully get a burning front to go through and convert the rest of the white dwarf to oxygen neon, I will have to undergo further compression and have this occur. And the outcome here is actively being debated whether this gives you an explosion or whether this gives you a collapse. This is the accretion-induced collapse scenario, which, which um, is in some sense a whole lecture on itself. I'm not going to do that. Um, but the point is, this is typically not viewed as a thermonuclear su supernovae scenario. And the reason for that is that you're, 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 um, it's a race between the oxygen igniting and these electron captures um, eating up electrons so that you reduce the shannon sakar mass and therefore you induce a collapse. Um, so typically, we think that this would, would actually do an accretion-induced collapse rather than an explosion. So, um, so if the star converts to oxygen neon, then this uh, option of carbon ignition in the core has probably gone away. So I think what I want to do is stop here and take questions for a minute before I do the last little piece. But I, don't, I actually don't know what my time is. She's taking such good notes. It's a good sign. <laughs> Ten more minutes. Okay. Okay. So I mean, we're getting pretty deep into the dirty laundry of thermonuclear supernovae. So I think that's why I want to back off for a moment and see if there's high-level questions. It's the end of the day. You've simmered all day. You're not going to detonate before the end of my talk.
Okay, so maybe for the last bit, let's let's raise up the. Uh, let me tap on his window. He's really in a he, he's really in a sound booth, right? He can't. So maybe what I'll do is is to try to satisfy some of this um, type one A mystery. I'll, I'll just briefly show you a little bit about. what the standard story is for the deflagration front. Because there was a tremendous amount of work done and there's just no way to really summarize it other than drawing a picture. So here's my white dwarf. It's let's say 1.35, so I'm gonna just remind everybody. It's been simmering for a long time, so there's a ball at the center that's vigorously convecting. Okay, so here's my hand wave. So the expectation that people have been building on is that as it hits that dynamical curve, there's pockets that start to ignite deep in the center. If I go in by hand and I take a little spot and I heat it up, it will rapidly complete burning, okay? That fluid element is then actually buoyant. So now I'm in multi-D, not 1D. That fluid element is then lighter than everything else and it rises, okay? So there is a rich amount of work asking what happens if I do one bubble, two bubbles, 10 bubbles, 1,000 bubbles, let me do the 1,000 bubble problem first. That's, that, we're back to 1D if I do 1,000 bubbles. And for 1,000, here's, here's the story. With 1,000, is that I basically transition to where I have a ball of nickel at the center, a front, <clears throat> a flame that's moving out at a speed that's much, much less than the sound speed. It's actually a flame front, a deflagration front. <clears throat> if it's moving at less than the sound speed, then the star can adjust to the fact that the center condition has changed a little bit. But this is light and this is heavy. Okay? So what happens if I have heavy sitting on light? I get Rayleigh-Taylor instability. So you'd say, well, why would you even do this model where this thing's Rayleigh-Taylor unstable? Well, this is a different Rayleigh-Taylor instability than, you than you've done in your coffee cup because this is a front that's moving at a finite velocity. And if you're moving at a finite velocity and a Rayleigh-Taylor front, you can actually stabilize the short wavelength perturbations. You outrun them, if you will. And so what happens in this scenario is I get to this phase and I'm still actually stable to Rayleigh-Taylor because I'm outrunning the small wavelength perturbations. Remember for Rayleigh-Taylor, this is hard to see, omega squared is, is GK delta rho over rho and K is 2 pi over lambda and this omega squared is, this is 1 over uh, the growth rate roughly squared. Don't worry about 2 pi's. And this is for a perturbation like this of lambda. Right? Okay, that's the Rayleigh Taylor. So what happens in this scenario is that I get to a certain size where suddenly I can fit in one wavelength of instability. So I grow out to a little bit further. Now I'm big enough that I can accommodate one wave. And this thing starts to wrinkle. Moves out further and it really starts to wrinkle. I get a corrugated front. I go out further, I get a more corrugated front. And eventually, um, and I've, I have a ball the center in the burn. I've only burned maybe a half the star at this point. Okay. At this point, you now have another problem. And again, there's um, a really rich, long literature of, of sustained effort by 20 people for 20 years on whether that environment can lead to transition to a detonation wave. And if you do a detonation wave at this point, then basically 
Um, if, you ha if you have stuff that was unburned in here because this turbulence is so rich, you start getting fingers of stuff coming down and fingers of stuff going out. You can actually burn out all of that material with the detonation wave, which you kind of need to do because you don't see a lot of unburned carbon at zero velocity. Right? So that's one scenario. So this is the many, this is the many plume or many bubbles scenario. Okay, and this is kind of the conventional story. Well, the other story that, that's started to emerge um, is one where I just have a few bubbles that ignite. And what's interesting about that is that this bubble, if you, you know, do a finite volume, this thing just rises up, as Dan showed, and you actually end up burning. It sort of rises up and breaks out. And I might have, you know, let's say 0.05 solar masses of, you know, mostly nickel 56 that comes out. And I have a few of them, right? Well, what happens to the star if suddenly it loses 10th of a solar mass? What's going to happen to the rest of the star? It's going to expand. If I expand, what's going to happen to the temperature in the core? It's going to drop. So you quench the burning. So what's kind of interesting about this scenario is that I get a few plumes at exit, and then I, f I quench the burning, and I leave a remnant behind. But I still have this stuff coming out at a pretty high velocity, because it's basically been sque uh, squeezed out like, well, not like toothpaste, uh, but squeezed out of the star, right? And so this can give me a light curve. And these light curves are pretty good matches to a class of type 1a supernovae that have low ejection masses. Uh, O5HK, O2CX are the prototypes. And those supernovae also show evidence that at late times there's still a remnant left behind. And so this is becoming a, a pretty good story of what happens if I do a deflagration at the center is I get a few plumes, I get an unusual supernovae. Uh, the case where I have a progenitor is a helium star. So there's an almost complete story, which we've never really had, right? And this might be what happens rather than this. And unfortunately, I don't think from the theory community, we're going to be able to say we know this is true and that's false or vice versa, right? It's, I mean, the, the data are really the arbiter for this because, you know, how do I know how many spots I'm really going to get? Um, so that's a great place to stop. And I will be happy to take questions until people can't ask anymore. Yes? These are supernovae of comparable luminosity? Th these are dimmer. Then they're a little bit, they're off the Phillips relation by about, you know, almost a magnitude. Yep. So they don't live on the Phillips relation. They're distinctly different. So for those, yeah, I'm not going to get into cosmology. So I was about to say something not polite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what's up the number of bubbles? No, we, that's what we don't know. Yeah, yeah. So again, this is, you know, you do it and you see what happens. But yeah, we, yeah. If you <laughs> well, I mean, no, it's, it's a free parameter. I mean, so I think people rightfully do, you know, what if this, what if that, and they, they see, right? I mean, so there's... Uh, the amount of ejected mass? No, not ejected, it's written, but the center of mass. There's a central convection zone that's burned. That's typically about a half solar mass. So the convective simmering, which is not complete burning though, it's just it's heated up, but it hasn't completely burned. Is about half a solar mass of material. Yeah, the same thing. So this 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 convective region. Well, this is different because now I've done deflagrations and this is all nickel. In this case, it's not. In this case, it's during the simmering phase. Yeah. Well, I didn't I didn't really explain it well. So in this case, it's still during the simmering phase where it's just you're burning some carbon oxygen, but you're not burning to completion. And then you just take a spot and just suddenly let it go burn to completion. And it's really lighter than the surrounding elements, and it just pops out. Um, the ejected mass, so now I'm going to use the, the data, because that's the only thing we have here. The ejected mass in the, um, is typically 0.2 to 0.3, something like that, in those supernovae. I'm thinking about just the dynamics. So you can yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of energy release. So, so yeah, it's unbound. It's definitely unbound. Yeah. Yeah. 
It is unbound. Is that what you're asking? If, yeah, yeah, it's unbound. Yeah. Yeah. Should that have the dense paper file within the neutron star? Maybe it's very sensitive to the result. You mean the white dwarf? Yes. Yes. So um, for this scenario, once the stuff's gone to infinity, and you waited a few sound travel times, it's just going to expand, right, and, and be at lower densities. It's going to it's going to be a, it's going to find itself the new solution at a one a one solar mass white dwarf instead of one point three five, right? It's going to be a big expansion, right? That's why you quench the. What's well, good about it? So this is the counterpoint, right? So I talked about how the density increases rapidly as you increase the mass. Well, the opposite is also true, right? If I decrease the mass, the density plummets by a factor of ten. That plummeting of a factor of 10 is going to happen on a time scale that's a dynamical time, which means it's going to be adiabatic. So the temperatures just, just totally plummet. And so you, you sort of shut off the burning completely, right? Which is why this is a nice story, because you, you know, the remnant, you're done. I mean, it's a cooling white dwarf. It's hot, but it's not burning any longer. So you've sort of ended its evolution. Yeah. Yeah. So for this two, um different scenarios will the amount of or, or fraction of the intermediate mass elements different be different? Oh probably. Yeah, I don't have that at the tip of my fingers. Yeah. Yeah, we could look. So so this um, so I can I can give the references for this one where they I mean they've done both both of these have been done. So it's known. I just don't know it. Yeah. Yeah. You know I know that this worked pretty well actually for the for O two CX and O five HK actually. Which was satisfying because usually you don't usually these scenarios just don't match the data, but this one this one you know you could get it to match nicely. So ah oh, sorry. Uh, so in this scenario uh, where you have a helium star is there anything special about the spot where the uh, strain from the accretion disk between the white dwarf? Oh, it's a great question. Um, so in that scenario, the um, the white dwarf is typically way inside the place you, you have it. You have a disk when you start, so that, that's not a, it's not direct impact. So there is scenarios where we can do direct impact. It's wide enough binary that the material from L1 forms an accretion disk. Okay. Um, however, once the white dwarf expands and nearly fills the Roche load, then we start to worry about the stream because now I, I have this. I don't have sort of vacuum and a white dwarf down here. I have this red giant envelope. And so we haven't really done that. That problem's not been addressed, which is how do you modify the accretion when you have this sort of red giant envelope that the stream's trying to get into? And what do we even mean by L1 versus L2? And where's the mass leading from? So this is an open problem, for sure, on the mass transfer. Could be that the angular momentum is different because it leaves L2, in which case this scenario is unstable. It merges. Yeah. So you can, you can dial the J dot from this, and it, you'll get a merger. Um, and that, that might actually be the right answer. I mean, might, none of this might be, you know, I hate to say it, but none of it might be true. Um, it might just be a merger. That would, I mean, can't control the universe, unfortunately. You won't be a good villain. No, I wouldn't be a good villain. Right. Okay, on that note, I'll stop. <laughs>